You never know what life is going to throw at you. You're going through daily life, taking care of the kids, going to work, and then you get thrown a curveball. My name is Margaret Anderson. I'm 51 years old. Um, I was a teacher, a high school teacher uh, locally. My husband and I have been married for 25 years, and our son, Eric, is 11 years old, and our daughter, Amelia, is seven years old. So we met in Baltimore at a natural products trade show going up an escalator. The challenge was she lived in New Jersey and I lived in Arizona, so she was geographically undesirable. And so over the course of a year, we decided that uh, we needed to be together. Eventually I convinced her to move to Arizona and then we got engaged. I had chemotherapy and radiation, and it all culminated in my having an autologous stem cell transplant, where I'm given my own stem cells. Uh, that that had left me, you know, while I was, I'm grateful to be alive, I'm grateful to be here, but it also has some long-term side effects, and the lowered immunity is one of them. And she recovered, but she, from that point, was always immune compromised, so a little more susceptible to colds and flus and, and things of that nature. And then um, she dropped the hammer. She said, I need to be close to my parents. And I, you know, nobody told me the rules. If you marry a Jersey girl, you have to move to Jersey. <laughs> so you know, we started to rebuild our life. My daughter was born in February of 2013. And so I was home with her and I just thought, with two young kids that I was feeling run down because of childcare, normal stuff. One night I couldn't even get off the couch. I spent the night on the couch because I was that exhausted, couldn't make it up the stairs. He noticed that I had black splotches on my flank all along my stomach and back. He took me to uh, my primary care physician. She told my husband to immediately send me right to JFK, to the ER. I really blacked out at that point. The attending physician noticed that she was in distress and she immediately was rushed into emergency um, and they had to put lines in in her arm and they tried to get lines other places. When the bacteria overtook her, her uh, bloodstream and her immune system, the um, cascade was, was very, very quick. If you look at the laundry list of symptoms for septic shock, I, I had them all. Um, the extreme fatigue and exhaustion and the mental acuity being off and um, my dexterity was off and they were trying to take care of the heart rate and take care of the blood pressure take care of the circulatory issues I mean it just it was almost like what do we do, what do we tackle first She's incredibly strong, right? She, um, everything that uh, they threw at her, she, she fought through it. And, um, and it, was a, it was a difficult time. For two weeks, um, kind of back and forth, every day was a new report, a new story, kind of a new thing to worry about. It was hard. My daughter was just an infant. My son was only four. It was devastating. I didn't even think about being grateful to be here, but I, um, I was just worried about what I could have lost. We were very fortunate that we had a lot of support. The hospital was great. We were able to be really involved with her care every day from early in the morning until late at night. We were able to be there to comfort her and to support her. My family, my mom, my brother, uncles, sister, they all came out over those first months to help out. 
we were very fortunate. Came out of sedation a little bit, out of the coma a little bit. So I was so confused. I thought I was in the hospital in Arizona. And the first thought that I had was that I relapsed. I remember saying, oh no, it's the cancer again. I thought I was in the hospital for cancer, not for septic shock. So it was like a month of dealing with the coma for a couple of weeks and then trying to rebuild my strength and then get the circulation, see if it would get back. And at that point we recognized that it wasn't going to get better. We first started to notice that my toes were turning blue. They looked like little blueberries, um, that the circulation wasn't getting down there. And um, it the gangrene started to set in and at that point they, it looked like amputation was um, inevitable. My daughter, like I said, was an infant. She's so young. My son was young. I, I had to take care of them. My husband was doing double duty and he was trying to work and also take care of the kids and we had a lot of support. But that was my main motivation to get home and try to take care of my family again. I met Dr. Ustall um, post-surgery after my double amputations, and Dr. Ustall laid out pretty clearly that I, would ha I had a lot of work to do. I would have to strengthen and prepare my uh, residual limbs so they could support the prosthesis and eventually bear weight on them and, and um, do the physical activity so I can lead somewhat, some semblance of a normal life. It was never even a thought to me to not have the limbs. I needed the limbs, I needed the prosthetics. I had to chase around two kids. There was no question that that's what my course was going to be. I was gonna to work toward that goal. Sure, my first interaction with Margaret was while she was in the hospital in the rehabilitation center. She had really survived this catastrophic event where her body really just shut down she had what we call multi-organ system failure, where she required dialysis, IV fluids. Uh, she had periods of confusion because of low blood flow to her brain. And ultimately, she lost both legs because of the poor blood flow due to low blood pressure. She was really very sick, and she was slowly emerging from that period of this, this terrible, devastating illness and, and then subsequent disability from the amputation of both her legs. Here we have a young, hopefully otherwise healthy mom with two young kids working as a teacher, that now her life has changed so dramatically and we're thinking, we're planning on how to get her back to that. But we can't sort of complete the whole process in one step. We go small steps at a time. So the staff at JFK was incredible for physical therapy and for all the work she did for occupational therapy and rehab and just really working to get the mental acuity back. Um, they were fantastic. I remember that early on, I had to shrink wrap my limbs so they wouldn't swell, so I could fit into my temporary prosthetic. And I didn't even want to touch my limbs at first. I was really, I remember just staring at the hospital and the nurses were like, you've got to do it, you've got to shrink wrap them. Well, it helped me, I think, with the realization of what my new situation was, it was also kind of hard to let go. It's not like you get released from the hospital, the swelling goes down post-surgery, and then you could automatically jump into your prosthetics. It's a time-consuming process because you are shaping the legs, you are shifting so much. So it took several months. I was impatient at that point. I wanted my new legs, but I was in the temporaries. And the more you walk on the legs, the more that you get um, the fitting right, and then you're ready. So it really is a very comprehensive, multi-specialty approach where we're making sure the medical problems are under good control, her recovery from all of her other insults to her body were getting better, and yet doing the physical approach to fitting her with artificial legs. Even that process alone is a long, slow, stepwise process. The transition period between where she could get on her legs and maneuver, it was, she was completely wheelchair bound. So all of the little things that we take for granted um, had to be accommodated. And even today, you, you can't shower in the legs, right? So when she gets ready for bed, she takes her prosthetics off. 
and then she's in the wheelchair, and she's got the same challenges that anybody in a wheelchair has. I had that first moment of walking, taking my first few steps with the occupational therapists at JFK, and they just took away and had their arms out. You know, I had someone in front of me and someone behind me so that I wouldn't waver, and that was, you know, it was for the longest time, I'm staring at these legs, the prosthetics, the sleeves, all of the equipment, which is so foreign to me at that point. It gets to a point where you can feel the nerves as if they're going down to my feet, and it almost feels natural. And, um, and, that, came, and that comes with time. I mean, that was jubilation. That was another, you know, ping, did it. <laughs> And I, so I set all the little goals. I'm going to go home. I'm going to lift a laundry basket. I'm going to be able to pick up my daughter. I remember that clearly as one of my big goals, being able to pick up and carry my children. For me, the first time she could bend over and pick our daughter up off the floor and pick her up and hold her. That was an amazing mouse goal. It's fantastic when we see patients regain their independence in almost any activity. But for a patient that loses both legs to amputation and then is finally able to get up and walk, it, it, that's really what rewards me and our whole team. When she says, I want to go back to walk on the beach with my family, that's a fantastic goal. So to get her there really meant building a program that got her from where she was right now at a very low physical functional level to what was then going to be a very high functional level. I've always loved the beach, I mean the shore. I love coming from Jersey and loving the shore. But that was one place that my family liked to go. Some of our best memories are going down the shore. That is our place and it's one place that I can at least forget a little bit about this situation. It's, it's different, I'm not running to the shore like I used to as a teenager, but it's one place where we can all go and kind of breathe and relax and kind of feel our place in, in the scheme of life here. <laughs> when you have two artificial legs, walking on the beach is very challenging. We had to go step by step, getting her first back to just simple walking on a level surface, then building up her endurance and her balance, and then walking outdoors on uneven surfaces, getting back home with her family, and then finally then getting to the point where she can tolerate something as unstable and unsteady as sand at the beach. I'm grateful for all of the people who chipped in and helped build me back up to something newer, something that uh, is different than what I've lived for 40 some odd years. It's an adjustment, but it, there is an overarching sense of gratitude. I mean, how do you thank someone who has given you another lease on life and how, who has supported you every step of the way when you're at your, when you're stripped bare of everything and you're at your lowest. I mean, it's a tremendous sense of, of gratitude. When Margaret's in her prosthetics, she is mobile. She is able to um, take care of the normal things around the home, to drive her car with, with hand controls. She's able to go to the store. She's able to take care of the kids with some concessions and adaptations around the house to make things work better for her. Um, she has very much a normal life, plus she has robot legs. So trying to be as normal as you possibly can with a, a very um, significant challenge. But she's an incredibly strong woman, she's an incredibly strong person, and she's adapted and we've all adapted from where she started. to where she is today, it's a miracle. It's a big adjustment even seven years later for me. And it's, it's constantly evolving, as it should, because I'm doing new things now that I haven't done before. And just allow for the bad days and be flexible with it. I wanna get better, I wanna get stronger and get better and still advocate for um, amputees. I belong to a couple of groups that um, do discussions and support and also legislative support for amputees. I'd like to think that we're now living a fairly average life. EJ enjoys karate, riding bikes, playing with his sister, 
Amelia is, you know, a wonderful seven-year-old. We have normal activities, trying to take school in stride, um, going to church on the weekends, visiting the, the grandparents, going swimming. We very much enjoy going to the beach. We're um, fortunate that we can travel a little bit in normal times. The kids love going to Hershey, for example. So all of these things we're able to um, enjoy and uh, we're very, very fortunate to have that. My advice is to find out what's important for you to do. For me, it was going to the beach. It was being able to share that time with my family. And you don't have to let go of your dreams. It might be a different way uh, to go about it. You might have to circumvent the way that you thought you were going to achieve what you wanted. And along the way, you, you discover these new goals that you have for yourself, and it's a big victory. You have to be open to constantly surprising yourself when you're an amputee, because you will surprise yourself.